and so he goes to this open pit mine, you know, where they did not think they dug a tunnel, you know, like the seven dwarfs, but like they just dug a pit down and they, they excavated it. And there's a cemetery there, they turned it into a park. Uh, and you know, when the mine closed. And there's a cemetery there, and you thought, gosh, that's weird. There's not like a town around here. So didn't they take people back to the um, to the town to get buried? I mean, did they, you know, nobody lived out here, right? And the park ranger's like, well, no, there were convicts that were working here for the state, and uh, when they died, the state just, the, the you know, mining company just buried them. Uh, and that led him to write the book. He sort of started digging around there. It turns out most southern states don't have a big legal system. They don't have a, a big infrastructure of jails or anything. The idea of a prison as a place where you send bad people to punish them, but also to maybe make them, in our phrase, the good members of society, productive members of society, it's a very northern idea in the 19th century that you, the prison is sort of reformatory, right, where you educate people and you maybe get them schooling that they didn't have, or you make them sort of cut out and determined to free themselves of their life of crime. The southern states didn't have that. That cost money. You gotta pay for land, build a prison, staff it, food for the inmates, and have it. Most southern states had a jail, a one big jail for the really bad people that you didn't want loose. And other than that, there was every county had a small jail for holding people until trials and drunk, the drunk tank and stuff like that. Uh, and so that's it. There was no sort of intermediate of like, this is where you put people that need to be in jail for like a while, but not forever, right? But this guy did something bad, but he didn't like murder anybody, right? Uh, and so in Mississippi, the big jail they had was Angola which is way down in the, in the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Mississippi, they had Parchment Farm, uh, which if you've ever seen the movie Cool Hand Luke, takes place on Parchment Farm. Uh, Parchment Farm was a big plantation in the Mississippi River Delta, uh, and it had no wall, infamously. They said, if you want to leave, you can just swim through the bayou and eat by an alligator, or there was a gun line uh, near the entrance, a big cleared area of a white line, and they would always try to get people when they brought them in. Uh, they said, just walk over the line and be free. And of course, some idiots would do it, and they'd shoot them in the back, right? And they'd say, that's why they call it the gun line. If you cross the gun line, they would shoot you. Uh, and so parchment was a big deal for the state of Mississippi because it produced all the food that the inmates ate, and then they sold the extra to pay for the operation of the, the prison. So basically, it was revenue neutral for the state. And so if you weren't a dangerous enough person to end up in parchment, uh, there really wasn't anywhere else to put you. And so that's when they came up with convict leasing, right? So what would happen is if you violated some laws, uh, they would charge you, they typically would fine you, and they would charge you some court costs, and maybe the person that you'd wrong would sue you for damages, and you'd end up with this big bill. And rather than ask you to pay, they know you couldn't, someone could come hire you, uh, right? Someone who had a business could hire you and put you to work. And instead of paying you a wage, they would feed you and give you clothing and shelter, and then the bulk of your wages, they would turn over to the state to defray the cost that you had racked up as a result of whatever infraction you did. So let's say you violated the vagrancy law, that's a $100 fine. Let's say you get $50 in court costs, right? And let's say someone sues you for 200 bucks damages because you owe them money, right? So you don't have a $350 damages you can't pay. So the state of Mississippi leases you out to someone who has a business, and the wages that you would be paid instead go back to the, the state for your fine and your court costs and the person who sued you uh, for the damages that they got against you, right? Where would you go work? Well, sometimes mines. Uh, in northern Florida, convicts did a lot of uh, work in the pine woods up in the northern part of the state, north of I-10 uh, today. Uh, they uh, tapped trees for uh, turpentine, they cut down pine logs and stuff. Uh, in a lot of places, the, the plantation owners, the planters, they leased convicts for as work as sharecroppers. And so imagine uh, the horribleness of getting into a dispute with your employer because you know he cheated you you know that he did, and maybe you can maybe you can call him on it, right? Uh, sometimes you can, and sometimes you can say, well, you know, I kept a set of boats, and I know the cotton sold for this much because I saw it in the newspaper, uh, and I know that I actually made twelve hundred, not a thousand dollars. And maybe he'll say, oh gosh, I was wrong, you know, I, you know, I made a mistake. I'll fix it. So maybe he decides to fire you. Uh, because maybe you're setting a bad example, right? Maybe you're uh, in the parlance of the stuff, maybe you're behaving in a way that's uppity, right? So he fires you, uh, and you know, the cops come because you're now a vagrant, you have a job. Uh, he puts the word out so no one will hire you. So you get, uh, you get hit with the fine, you get hit with the court costs, and he sues you for the money he owes you. And then uh, he comes to the jail and he offers to lease your labor back from the state. He says to the state, I'll pay this guy a wage, uh, I'll give him food and a place to live, and I'll pay the wage to the state of Mississippi, some of which can go back to me, some of which goes to the state. And so you end up in chains as a convict working for the guy who you used to be an employee for. Uh, right, uh, and so it's again, it's different than slavery uh, in 
detail, but in practice, it's actually not that really that different at all, right? Uh, and as you might imagine, I don't have a particularly great incentive to treat you well if you're my convict DC. If you go to work for someone uh, and they treat you like garbage, you'll quit and find another job. If you're a convict, it's, <laughs> you can't quit, right? Like you have to work for me until I decide I don't need you or until uh, you're done, right? And as you might imagine, uh, when I deduct the cost of uh, your food and your uh, board and stuff, you might be working for like a penny an hour, right? Which is gonna, how long is it gonna take you to pay back $350 in fines working a penny an hour, right? Uh, good luck seeing the other side of that in the rest of your life, right? And so the whole point is this system is more complicated, but it sort of replicates slavery in some, some basic ways, yeah. Yes. Like, Although it was super nice when it was in Gone the Wind, she was really a nice person, wasn't she? Because uh, Gone with the Wind is, is the most bullshitty thing that's ever been written in, in the American South. But yeah, that's that's what she did, is they hired communists. Because in, uh, in, the, in the North, they did that too. If you worked in the prison, but in the North, it was sort of like, this is a way to like teach you a skill, or we're gonna like you know get something out of your time in prison or whatever. In the South, it was like, well, you know, I'm the state of Mississippi, I don't have room for you people, so like I'm gonna let people hire you, and then it's the, you're their problem. Because the southern state governments were very small and had no money. Uh, and maintaining you know, things like Sing Sing Correctional Facility or whatever is like, who's got money for that, right? Who's got money for giant prisons? And so instead, we should hire new people out. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of roads in the south, um, a lot of uh, irrigation projects, a lot of railroads got laid by convict labor. Uh, absolutely. And so, uh, having said that, uh, again, sharecropping is, is, again, more complicated, but perhaps, you know, the same in a certain way, right? Uh, so it's worth putting up here, uh, here's an actual photograph of actual sharecroppers uh, in the South uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, this is a little bit later. This is this is like 1880s, 1890s probably. Uh, and so what you can see, uh, they live in that shack, uh, which is the place that they live. Uh, and you can see that, uh, I also thought this picture was somewhat poignant because uh, you know that this uh, lady is dressed in her nicest clothes. Uh, she's got a white shirt on. Like, you cannot probably imagine how quickly a white shirt would get dirty in a dirt floor cabin. So she's clearly gotten herself cleaned up as nicely as she can for this photo. Uh, and they don't have two chairs. They have one chair because he's kneeling and not sitting. Uh, but they do it very proud of the fact that they're getting their picture taken and they dressed up nice for it. But that's that's what a sharecropper's cabin would look like. Sometimes they were the old slave cabins that would just get dragged to the uh, to the shares, right? And so I would say, oh, well, you guys can live on the slave cabins. I'll just give them to you. But nobody wanted to live in the old slave quarters. They wanted to live on the, the, the land that they farmed to at least have the idea that it was your own personal space. And so a lot of times they would just hook a horse up to it, drag it, or pick it up and move it, uh, or, or knock it down and rebuild them. Uh, and so that cabin may have existed for quite some time. They existed for a uh, just be for this uh, slave cabin, right? Uh, and so as you might imagine, one of the problems that will happen is that when the economy begins to pick up in the northern states, around the turn of the century in particular, uh, a lot of African Americans, particularly young people, will just leave. Uh, and their parents encourage them to do so. After all, you look around and you grew up in this cabin, and your father's like, look, uh, if you stick around, you're gonna do this. So maybe you know, find out about a job in Michigan or you know, Ohio or someplace like that. Uh, and so the, the big uh, exodus of African Americans headed north will take place uh, between about 1890 and about 1920. Is, the, is most of it. There's a little bit uh, in the 1930s and more in the 40s. Uh, and there's a, there's a, a hilarious, uh, sort of deeply ironic point when uh, just before automation comes into the South and tractors become really common, you still need a lot of labor, right? And the migration has reached the point of something like 20 to 30,000 people every month or so leaving the South, going for the North. And one uh, sharecropper, uh, one Southern plantation owner who uh, needs sharecroppers actually takes out ads in Northern newspapers trying to convince black people to come back. They'll pay you to work on the, and of course they're like, no, no obviously not. Yeah, we'll, right. We continue to go work for a several dollar a day wage in a factory in the North and not have anything to do with this. And so if you think of the big cities in the North as having these giant African-American populations, that really is a factor of the late 19th and early 20th century when mostly it's black people leaving segregation and sharecropping, right? They, they, they leave this stuff because they don't want to do this anymore, uh, right? And once automation hits, then all of a sudden it doesn't become as much of an issue because if you have a giant plantation, you just buy a combine, you buy a tractor, you don't really need the labor as much as you did. Some things have survived, uh, Florida orange picking, uh, sharecropping survives for quite a long time because you can't do it by machines, you have to have people physically doing it, right? Uh, but as you might imagine, uh, the 20th century will change a lot of that, right? The, the, the availability of high paying jobs in, in factories in the North, uh, not as high paying as they would be for white people, but still high paying uh, is, a, is a big factor in the, in the sort of demise of this kind of a system. 
Uh, but for a long time, this is this is the thing. And again, if, remember, if the federal government had been involved in Reconstruction, they, they could have prevented this. They could have, you could do something about this. You could these people have a, a right a case to make in federal court that this is unfair. Vagrancy laws are enforced in a way that's discriminatory on their face. Uh, but the federal government isn't involved in that, right? The Civil Rights Act at the federal level will go unenforced. Uh, the 14th, uh, 15th Amendments go unenforced. Uh, and so the, uh, the Supreme Court is going to invalidate even the KKK Act. They're going to throw it out as unconstitutional. Uh, and so I think that's a, uh, that's a thing to mention is that this all works because the federal government's committed to do something about reconstruction becomes very difficult to enforce. If you're a Republican office holder at the federal level, there's, the popular will isn't there. No one wants to pay for it. No one wants to have anything to do with it. It's viewed as this illegitimate project. You're, you're being unfair to the Southerners. And what you can argue, we talked about this a lot last time, there's those two mutually exclusive ideas about the Civil War. Free the slaves, reunite the Southerners with the Union. Right? Free the slaves, rebuild the Union. Uh, there wasn't really a way to do both of those things without making somebody unhappy. Right? If you free the slaves, the Confederates are mad. If you bring the Confederates in to make them happy, you're probably going to have to screw over the slaves, right? Uh, and so as it turns out, uh, by the 1870s, the argument is the Civil War was really about the Union. It was about bringing everybody back. And in order to do that, we just this is what we have. This is the price of that, right? Uh, and so uh, that, and the Southerners are quick to, to sort of, they see that opportunity, right? They, they, they see that. They're like a little kid who knows that one of his parents is the, the not uh, disciplined parent and the other one is the disciplined parent. So they will always go to that parent to, to get into trouble, right? My daughter will always ask me things, not my wife, because she knows I'm probably gonna shrug and say, I don't care. Uh, and so uh, the Southerners realize that there is that opportunity there to sell the Civil Wars about the Union and I don't even remember the slave thing and then look, it's fine. We'll just handle reconstruction. Don't worry about it. You know, pull the plug, let it go, that's that, right? And so, Having said that, uh, we can talk about the politics of it as well. Um, you can see um, here is the uh, the injustice of Reconstruction, uh, Thomas Nast in Harper's Weekly. This is a white man's government. Uh, and you have allied together. You have uh, the uh, capitalist who just wants to make money, right? He's got all the, the bonds and the deeds. You have the former Confederate soldier uh, who has got uh, the, the Bowie knife and the whip, by the way. Uh, and then over here, you've got the troglodytic Irish voter, uh, who Nass is a good Republican, so he hates Irishmen, he hates Democrats, and he hates people to drink booze. Uh, that guy's all three, right? Uh, and you notice the, uh, the Irish voter's got a club marked to vote because he's a savage. He looks like an eighth man because he's Irish, uh, and he's got the bottle in his pocket, right? Uh, and so and he's wearing a hat that says Five Points. Five Points is the neighborhood in New York City. Uh, it's in Lower Manhattan, uh, where five streets met in the little plazas, like Canal, Halstead, the Plains, and two others. Uh, and they met in a little plaza, and in the late 19th century, it was the center of gang activity in New York City. It was run by a number of gangs. The huge Irish immigrant population was um, fodder for the Democratic Party of New York's machine of getting out votes on uh, election day, uh, which regularly returned uh, Democratic majorities in Manhattan, even though the state was mostly Republican. Uh, and so, uh, if you see the gangs of New York, it takes place at Five Points. This is not totally an accurate picture of the violence. There was a, there was a mission house that had a little lake in front of it uh, in the 1870s and 80s, and when they drained it to pave the street in the 1890s, there's something like 100 bodies, of the skeletons they found in the lake, right? Uh, and so this is where this guy is from, right? If you go, by the way, to Five Points today in New York City, uh, it's this nice little tiny quiet neighborhood. There's a little park in the middle uh, that's uh, it's in Chinatown. It used to be in Little Italy, but Chinatown is pushing Little Italy north about a half a block every couple of years. Uh, and so the park uh, where all the where this guy and his buddies beat up other people, uh, it's actually a little park full of Chinese moms pushing their kids in swings. Uh, and just up the street is the good uh, Italian restaurants, which ironically are now run uh, by Chinese people. Uh, and so the, the big uh, bakery is Ferrara's Bakery, which is really, really good cakes and cookies. And when I went in to buy cannoli, the girl behind the counter was on the phone taking orders in Cantonese. Uh, and so uh, Chinatown is sort of call as a little Italy, right? But that's, that's right where this is a reference to at five points. And so NASA is, is and, you, and you can see they're standing on, on the back of the uh, of this nice African-American guy. And it's really like NASA is really drawing out here just so we don't have to know. There's no guess, it's not metaphor, right? He's literally holding an American flag. He's literally got the Union Army cap in front of him, and there's the bow, there's the, the, the jar for the, the tokens that you go with, right? Uh, he's reaching he's reaching for the vote, but it can't happen, right? Uh, and so the presidential election of 1876 is, is the end of Reconstruction in that respect, right? Remember, we talked about how it could be 1876 or 70. Is 1876, we vote, 1877, the guys get sworn in, right? So it's depending on what, what you want to use. Uh, and so you can see the contenders uh, here, 
Uh, so you can see on, uh, for some reason, the picture of Samuel Tilden is smaller. Uh, on the left, Samuel Tilden, a Democrat from New York City. Uh, on the right, Rutherford B. Hayes, a Republican governor of Ohio. Uh, and so it's Tilden, the Democrat from New York, or 